At its height by the turn of the 16th century, the Inca Empire stretched over 2,500 miles of western South America, from southwest Colombia to Santiago. From the capital of Cusco in what is today southern Peru, the Inca emperors governed the lives of millions of subjects in the largest nation of the Americas at the time of Spanish conquest. The tasks of cataloging exchanges and disseminating commands required a technology that could encode such information across such a vast area. This technology would also need three important features to work effectively. The code must be consistent, precise, and permanent. These qualify writing. Hello! This episode in the Native American Writing Systems playlist brings us to South America for two important scripts created among the ancient civilizations along the continent's west side. The most famous of these is the quipu, used for thousands of years in this area, yet known from especially Inca culture. The other is the tohapu, which used intricate and often colorful patterns to organize ideas. We will see examples of each in this episode. Quipu comes from the native Quechua word for knot, which the Inca themselves called these instruments. They were made to store data in a form that could literally fit in the palm of your hand, and two outstretched arms could hold the longest. Archaeological excavations at the Peruvian site of Caral date the earliest forms of quipu to almost 5,000 years ago, and later civilizations such as the Wadi also employed the technology. But it was the Inca that used it most extensively to record the activities and transactions that kept their empire running. Over a thousand quipu survive today, from mostly the ancient and colonial periods. Yet into the present day, native peoples in a few remote corners of Peru preserve the tradition. Hanan Historia y Cultura provides more details on these cases, and a link to the video below. Studying how the quipu was made has helped to understand how it could encode information. Cotton is the primary material, spun into yarns that could be braided, knotted, and bound to a primary cord. The quipu could combine multiple features to specify the data. Colors, amounts, and positions, indeed even the spin of the yarn and the orientation of the knots themselves. I saw this beautifully preserved example and the next at the Dallas Museum of Art, and I linked to them in the description. Scholars have identified several common parts of a quipu. Like a thick spine binding the text together, a primary cord provides the base attaching all of the components. The primary cord trails into an end string that may run even longer than the primary itself. Additional strings provide supplementary information that could be regionally specific. These accessory strings may also bear knots counting or summarizing the present cords. They are like the metadata for a document. And remember that quipu is the Quechua word for knot, the most basic and definitive feature in this writing system. Their main purpose is for counting, with the same decimal base used in the Quechua language. Representing the unit of one is the outermost position, counted by the number of its spins or knots. Working farther inward, along regular intervals, are the higher bases of ten, also counted by spins or knots at each level. These units continue inward to count tens, hundreds, thousands, and in some cases up to the tens of thousands. The next image will show sample amounts. Pendant cords are the strands holding the knots. They are usually directly attached to the primary cord, but it is also possible to find a few on looping cords running parallel to the former. This fascinating exemplar of the quipu as a counting tool is in the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Its display illustrates not only the totals from each of a group of pendant cords, but also their combined amount in a so-called summary cord, highlighted above. Each summary cord reflects the total from its respective section. If you are familiar with computer science, the summary cords recall pointers. The display counts the quipu from the four pendant cords in the first color-coded section. Cord 1. The unit knot has eight spins, followed by three knots for tens, counting 38. Chord two, three ones, seven tens, and two hundreds for 273. Chord three, eight ones, five tens, and two hundreds for 258. Chord four, nine ones, and eight tens for 89. 
If a position has no knots, it stands for zero. These four amounts add to 658. This same number appears in the summary chord above. Eight spins for the unit knot, five tens, and six hundreds. This summary chord therefore indexes the pending chords belonging to the first of the color-coded sections. We don't know what this section was exactly counting, but we do know that it was definitely counting something. In 1997, a massive, elaborate burial was discovered in a cliffside cave at Laguna de los Condores, or Condor Lake, in the Amazonas region of northeast Peru. This is a reconstruction of the funerary structures called chulpas in the Quechua language, and it is housed in the Leme Bamba Community Museum, which I present in another video. Among the chulpa remains were the wrapped bundles of 219 mummies. These now reside in the museum for conservation, research, and display. An extraordinary part of the excavation was the discovery of 33 quipu. Most date to the period before the conquest, but remains of Spanish artifacts suggest that burials of elite people continued into early colonial times. Even though exceptionally well preserved in the remote necropolis, the 33 quipu were found clumped into massive tangles that researchers had to carefully unravel. The most remarkable of these is one with 762 strings grouped into 24 sections. Gary Erton, one of the foremost scholars on the quipu, concluded that most of these strings represented the 730 days in a two-year span, and it recorded the expected tributes to the Inca Empire from this region similar to the Aztec tribute lists introduced in an earlier episode in this playlist. It is therefore nicknamed the Calendar Quipu. A few other examples are on display in the Leme Bamba Community Museum. Reading and writing Quipu was a highly specialized and restricted profession in the Andes. Those who kept these documents were the Quipu Camayoj, those with specialization in Quipu. This was a formal title and a hereditary position in the nobility. Colonial sources have described what the quipu contained, and a few also directly transcribe their text. However, these writings explain nothing about how a quipu's design actually specified content. We know that the colors were deliberately grouped, but what each color meant remains a mystery. New research from Harvard, pioneered with computer modeling by former undergraduate Mani Medrano, is advancing the hypothesis that the colors could distinguish social categories. Colonial documents have noted that quipu stored administrative and historical records, and there is some indication that speakers may have used them as scripts to guide their public announcements and other performances. Although the quipu is by far the most well-known medium for storing knowledge in the indigenous Andes, it was not the only available. In its broadest sense, tohapu refers to the design of grid-like patterns, found especially on clothing but also other media. Surviving examples from the ancient world boast a variety of colors in intricate forms within each square, as on this tunic from the Wadi civilization. Their designs marked ethnic identity, political office, and other aspects of social standing. The dry, thin air of the Andean heights have preserved the color and build of a wealth of clothes and fabrics, whose designs we can continue to admire in the present. This cap at the Metropolitan Museum of Art comes from the Tiwanaku civilization, from the region of Lake Titicaca. Steps, frets, spirals, faces, and a zigzag, all in bold hues, animate the piece. From its earliest colonial references, tohapu often connoted embroidery or other forms of weaving. However, the rare mention of wooden panels painted in similar schemes breaks out from obscurity. Like certain kinds of quipu, these decorated wooden panels also likely scripted texts for narrative performance. Unfortunately, no remaining examples of these wooden pieces are known, and only one colonial manuscript by an indigenous author presents any of its symbols within the text itself. The work in question is the Report on Antiquities from the Kingdom of Peru by Don Juan de Santa Cruz Pachacuti Yamqui Salcamaywa. By 1613, he sketched its most famous illustration, a cosmogram that I describe in my video on the philosophical concept of Pacha in the Quechua world. 
Another unfortunate effect of colonial occupation was that the traditional wooden tohapu boards not only fell into disuse, but also disappeared altogether. Native authors and artists continued to reference the idea of the tohapu grid, but its meaning shifted from a text with specific ideas to an icon of past indigenous glory. Historian Tom Cummins has described examples of this transformation in colonial works such as this Kero Cup. The Tohapu grid on it says less about an encoded message in the symbols, but rather the idea in the design as a whole, what native civilization used to be, and perhaps following the concept of Inkadi, what it could be once again. Kipu and Tohapu used markings to express specific information through conventionally understood code. These South American media therefore behaved much like the working definition of writing introduced early in the present playlist. Without a surface to impress, the kipu especially challenges us to rethink the creation and purposes of writing across cultures. Now that we have visited South America for a look into its ancient writing forms, our next video will explore some of the scripts created for North American languages since the 19th century. Join us for the following installment.